So here we are uh, in the last three weeks of the story of Joseph. Uh, we've been here uh, since May, would you believe? And, uh, and it's all coming to its kind of final conclusion. And we're getting not only actually to the end of the story of Joseph, but actually really the last time we will see his entire family. Um, the book of Genesis ends at the end of chapter 50, uh, with the death of Jacob, but actually that is the end of what we hear of this family um, and the next step, Exodus chapter 1, and we are suddenly transported a few centuries into the future. But there is still plenty to learn uh, before we get there from the story of Joseph. Um, so let's read, I've um, got a, a chunk to read today uh, from Genesis chapter 46, and we're going to read all the way down to 47 verse 12. Uh, strap yourselves in. It's a bit of a long one, but there's uh, plenty here for us. So, Israel set out with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. And Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives and the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport them. So Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt, taking with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan. Jacob brought with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons and his daughters and granddaughters, all his offspring. These are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his descendants, who went to Egypt. Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, the sons of Reuben, Hanuk, Paloi, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, the sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah, but Ur and Onan had died in the land of Canaan, the sons of Perez, Hezron, and Hamel, the sons of Issachar, Tola, Puah, Jashub, and Shimron, the sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jalil. These were the sons Leah bore to Jacob in Paddan Aram, besides his daughter Dinah. The sons and daughters of his were 33 in all. The sons of Gad, Zephon, Hagi, Shuni, Esbon, Eri, Aradi, and Areli. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, and Beriah. Their sister was Serah. The sons of Beriah, Heber, and Malkiel. These were the children born to Jacob by Zilpah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Leah, 16 in all. The sons of Jacob's wife Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. In Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim were bought, born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. The sons of Benjamin, Bela, Becca, Ashbel, Gerar, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Muppin, Hopim, and Ard. These were the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob, 14 in all. The sons of Dan, Hashim, the sons of Naphtali, Jaziel, Guni, Jeza, and Shilem. These were the sons born to Jacob by Bilhah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Rachel, seven in all. All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his descendants, not counting his sons' wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family who went to, which went to Egypt were 70 in all. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Jacob, uh, Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, now I am ready to die since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. And Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who are living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds, they tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer, your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. 
Joseph went and told Pharaoh, My father and brothers with their flocks and herds and everything they own have come from the land of Canaan and are now in Goshen. He chose five of his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked the brothers, What is your occupation? Your servants are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. They also said to him, We have come to live here for a while because the famine is so severe in Canaan and your servants' flocks have no pasture. So now, please let your servants settle in Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know of any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramesses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. There we go. And so the people of Israel, such as they are, uh, move to Egypt. And right at the beginning of this passage, the first thing really that happens is that for the first time in a long time, God speaks. God actually speaks to Jacob, and God reassures Jacob. This is probably quite important for Jacob, um, who I think at times struggles to be trusting um, and has not always been trustworthy himself, uh, but also because previously when there had been famine in the land in the time of Abraham, his grandfather, God had been very specific and told him not to go to Egypt. It's also a big move because he's moving from what was the promised land. The land that had been promised to Abraham. Why? Why would he leave this land that had been promised? Only because God had told him. And so they set off, they go via Beersheba, uh, which was a well that had been dug by his grandfather Abraham known as the Well of Seven, but potentially also Well of the Oath. It marks the southernmost border of Israel and comes up in a number of places later on in the Bible. And then we finally get the genealogy that we didn't get at the beginning of the story. You may, no, you won't. Back at the beginning, when we started, Joseph, I said, it's really interesting that what we don't have at the beginning of this story is a list of the genealogy, because that's how normally these stories would start. And we didn't get that at the beginning of Joseph and now finally it kicks in and we hear all of these uh, sons of sons um, and the odd daughter gets a mention apologies ladies that's how it was then Um, but we finally get that part of the story And, and, and so the people of Israel are saved but even here there is an ominous overtone partly because we know the outcome we know what happens here and and actually those uh, hearing these stories for the first time would have already known the outcome that the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt so there is a sense of 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 ominous here but then we also uh, get this this weird interaction between Joseph and his brothers and Pharaoh and he's saying look you know Tell them you're shepherds, because they hate shepherds, which seems odd, um, and go and settle in the land of Goshen, which is a bit removed. And it was certainly good land for them to be in. It was land where their flocks could grow. Um, But is there a sense also here that Joseph is trying to protect his family from the Egyptian culture? To perhaps stop them from fully assimilating into this culture, even though it seems that he has. And indeed, the separation seems to have worked. Uh, shepherds were despised, were detestable, it seems. Uh, we don't, we're never given a reason why this was the case. Perhaps it was because they were nomadic traveling people, um, and therefore they weren't tr- as trustworthy, perhaps, as, as people who lived in, in cities and settlements. 
Um, or was it perhaps because uh, much of the livestock was used for sacrifices and, and that was somehow not seen as a, as a clean job? We don't really know. So because they were shepherds, were they ever really accepted into the Egyptian society? We don't know. But we do know they grew in number. So we're told uh, at the beginning of Exodus that they grew in number and were likely grew in prosperity as well. Bear in mind, and we'll, and we'll see this uh, when we come next week, that because of the famine, increasing numbers of people not only um, had to come to Egypt to buy food, but eventually ran out of money and had to sell their land to the Pharaoh in order to buy food, and then eventually to sell themselves as slaves. And yet here are these Hebrews who have somehow moved in, and they get all the food they need, and they have all the land they need, and so they grew in number and prosperity. And so we are told that gradually, after the death of Joseph, after the death of Pharaoh, that gradually the Jewish people were oppressed and then enslaved by the Egyptians. But that all comes in Exodus. We're not doing Exodus yet. Come back in a couple of years' time when we, go, when we get to Exodus and we'll maybe do that. Um, but that's what's the beginning of what's happening here. Such a significant movement in the history of the Israelites. And actually, as I was reading this, what was coming to mind, and this may, maybe you think this is a bit of a leap, but this is what really struck me as I was reading this, was that there are some similarities here with the birth and growth and progression of the church. Because actually when, uh, when the church first started, AD 33 or so, and we're beginning to see the early church uh, in the New Testament, they were very much separated from the culture around them. They had to operate in various levels of secrecy, depending on the amount of persecution that was going on at that time. They were most likely a uh, despised people group, certainly at different times, and a misunderstood people group. And so for the first uh, couple of hundred years, you, you have this sense of separation. And then uh, famously, Constantine comes to faith in around 312. And suddenly, the most powerful man in the empire is a Christian. Similarly, Joseph comes to power, and suddenly the second most powerful man in the known world um, is a Hebrew. In 313, the Edict of Milan comes out declaring uh, tolerance for the Christian faith, so no longer are Christians persecuted. And, and, and Christianity kind of comes alongside culture. And that's what we see here, the Israelites coming and living alongside the Egyptians. 380 AD, the Edict of Thessalonica, Christianity becomes a state religion, and suddenly it's central to culture. It suddenly has a position of power, and we enter what's called in history Christendom. Now, I don't think the Israelites ever ended up in that position. Um, I don't think they ever took complete power. I don't think. I know they never took complete power in Egypt. But they did grow in number and prosperity and were seen as a threat so they certainly were important in Egypt. And the church in the Western world took center stage from the fourth century onwards. And it's only now in the last couple of decades that we have really seen the fall of Christendom in the Western world. We no longer live in a culture which has Christianity at its center. And I think there's a real warning in this story today. Knowing what we know about what happened to Israel, there is a warning here for us too. The Israelites ended up being enslaved by the culture around them. And we need to ask ourselves, could this happen to us? 
Could this happen to the church? Could the church be enslaved by the culture in which it has found itself, in which it has made its home, in which it has grown and prospered, but is now no longer central? And I think the answer is yes. Yes, we can. Perhaps even yes, we have. So what does cultural slavery look like? I want to suggest two simple things. They're obvious. The first one is it looks like assimilation. That is, we gradually take on the shape of the culture that is around us. We start to accept cultural norms as being the norms of our faith. And, and actually, I think for most people in the church today, they can already, you're probably already thinking of examples of what this might look like, of things that, that you think are things that, that, that might happen. But it, we need to be really careful with something like this because it, it's very easy to assume that this is something that is happening to the church out there and not to the church in here. But is that true? When we think about the culture of the church here at Sanderford, are there things which are actually the culture of the world around us? I'm sure there are plenty of things that are not. But I'm equally sure that there are things that actually are the influence of probably white, middle-class, Scottish culture. And assimilation is very easy to fall into. And, and it's easy to become a church that welcomes everyone but changes no one. That actually looks so like what is outside, suddenly there is no reason to come in. Uh, Tom Holland a British historian wrote a book a couple of years ago called Dominion, and he traces the roots of much of Western culture to Christianity. And um, he was in an interview, and he was talking about the church, and, and what he said was, he said, why is it that, now he's English, he said, why is it that, that we have bishops who are talking about politics and X and Y and Z? Surely they should be talking about sin and repentance and the Trinity and matters of the faith. If all they do, if all they are, is another talking head on the topics that are all being talked about by everyone else, then why is the church different? And I think he has a point. So assimilation is a real issue and it can enslave us, but we can equally be enslaved by culture through segregation or sectarianism, where we try and separate ourselves from the culture around us. Because actually what happens is when we try so hard to be separate from culture, too often what happens is we define ourselves by what we are not. And therefore we're being influenced just as much by culture as if we were trying to be what culture is. And we end up following the culture Constantly looking for it and going, well, the culture says this, therefore we must do that instead. And we become contrarian in our nature. And segregation ends up becoming, firstly, following culture, but secondly, turning people away at the door, before the door, before they even come through the door. Because it welcomes no one and it changes no one. So we must not become enslaved to the culture in either of those ways. So what, what does it mean to be the church of Christ in a post-Christendom world? Firstly, we need to recognize that Christian behavior and ideals are no longer held by the majority. Now, that's probably not news to anyone, but let me continue. Nor will they be enshrined by law. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try and influence politics or law. That would actually become segregation. 
That's where you become uh, some of the Anabaptist movements uh, or at the most extreme end, the Amish. Um, We still believe that actually God's ways are the best ways for human flourishing, for all people. And so we should attempt to have that influence, but we need to recognize that the country we live in is not a Christian country, that its laws are not Christian, that its politicians are not Christian. And while we should seek to influence, we need to not seek to suddenly try and make it Christian through, regu- through legislation. That's not going to happen. We don't have that power anymore. We are not at that center anymore. And I, it's not a matter of resigning ourselves. It's not a matter of giving up. But it is a recognition that we live in a different world. Go and read through the, the, the epistles of Paul and say to yourself, at what point did Paul attempt to influence Roman law? Because I don't think you could find it. So much of his teaching is about saying, how then should we live in the situation that we are in? So Christian behavior and ideals are no longer held by the majority in our society. Also, we need to recognize that the church is no longer a societal hub, a social hub. And again, we're beginning to see this. People will not come to us for major life events increasingly when their children are born, when they want to get married, when they die. And we know this to be true. It used to be that everyone, regardless of their connection with the church, would turn up with their baby to be baptized. The people who wanted to get married would almost all want to be married in their local church. And when there was a funeral, the church would be involved. But that's no longer the case. And people will not come to the church for community events, for social events. It used to be that the church sat at the center of all that was going on in the community. And the number of people you would find who say, well, you know, where did you meet your husband or your wife? Well, we met at a dance at the church, or we met at playing badminton in the church hall, or at the youth events that were run at the church. These things do not happen anymore. People do not go to the church. There are so many other options out there. And so we must go to them. We cannot expect people to come to us. We cannot expect and wait and say, well, they'll, eventually they'll come in the door, and then we've got them. Because that will not happen. The church is not the center of our politics, our society, our social culture. But also we need to recognize increasingly that we cannot assume any prior experience. And I think here at Sandiford we probably have a better idea of that because of actually uh, the work we've done with people from other cultures which often do not have any prior experience But increasingly within Scotland, we are talking about the same. When I uh, first came through to Glasgow and we were working in Whiteinch, what we were finding was that we were talking to young people who were third or even fourth generation of non-churchgoers. Forget about belief systems. So that is, their parents did not go to church. Their grandparents did not go to church, and in some cases, their great-grandparents had never attended church. And increasingly, that is the case. These people have no church connection. They have no biblical knowledge. They may learn one or two stories in, in school, but that will be the limit if they remember that at all. And so they, they won't know their Noah from their Moses. They won't know their Isaiah from their Jesus. We cannot assume anything. And alongside that, there are no ethical or moral givens anymore. We cannot assume that people think the way that we do. And so we need to think very carefully about how we approach these people. 
and how we approach everyone um, without assuming knowledge. I, even standing here on a Sunday morning, I'm aware of an assumption of, of, of knowledge that we stand up to sing, that we pray in a certain way, or we do certain things, and we know what we're doing when we do them. That we know that when there is a prayer at the beginning of the service, and we've all shut our eyes and bowed our heads at the right moment, we all need to look up at the screen to be able to read the Lord's Prayer. That's assumed knowledge. That back in the old days when we would say, um, open your Bible to the Old Testament or to the book of Genesis, that people would even know where that was. Would even know where to look for the contents page. Um, I was in a church where they, they would announce the page numbers, which was great, but they would say, oh, it's page number 324 in the New Testament section of the Bible. Well, that's great, but if, you, uh, if you're having to look up page numbers, then you probably don't know which is the new and which is the old. So we need to think about how we speak, how we act, how we interact. And we need to recognize that for all of history, including our time, the church has always, always used timely methods to present its theological principles to the world. That, that means we use a cultural uh, hook to show people something. That's why some of, the, some of the hymns that we sing now, the tunes originated in pubs. And we don't think of them as pub tunes because we've been singing them for long enough and they were pub tunes 150, 200 years ago, but they would use the music of the day and attach theological ideas, biblical, scriptural words to the, that music as a way of um, helping people to learn and to understand. And we need to recognize the things that are really important to who we are as a church, that are actually the timeless principles of the gospel. And then we need to say, how can we present those in a way that is relevant to our culture? Because all churches are culturally relevant. The question is, which culture? And indeed, which century? We are being culturally relevant to. And lastly, and um, I am going to finish on this, um, but it is an important principle, I think, and it's one that, that I have come to believe in very strongly. Um, I first heard it, I think, probably from a guy called Lawrence Singlehurst, um, but he, was, he talked about the way that churches had shifted in their approach to those who don't believe. And what he said was um, that in, in that era, middle of the last century, in a Christendom era, so often what we, our approach was we would expect people to come to church and behave in a particular way. And when we knew they could behave in a particular way, we would then see if they believed the right things. And if they behaved in the right way and they believed the right things, at that point they could then belong and become part of our community. And he said, that's just not how people work anymore. That's not how people process. It needs to be the other way around. Because actually we don't live in a culture where Christian behavior is the norm anymore. What people need to know first is that they can belong that they can come and be part of who we are. And as they see who we are, they may then begin to ask the questions that would lead them to believe. And then it is only when actually, and we know this, and this is the message of the gospel, it is only when we are transformed by Jesus, then, then our behavior changes. So people should be allowed to come and belong, be part of who we are, and be part of what we do. And their behavior might be off the wall. 
And there are still things that are going to be acceptable and unacceptable, and, and we need to negotiate those boundaries with people. But actually, there is a sense of belonging that needs to come first. And then we move people to the place where they say, actually, I, I believe this thing, and I don't understand it all, and I haven't grown up in it, and I don't know what all the Bible says, but actually I've met Jesus, and I believe in him. And then we go from there and say, okay, now that you believe in Jesus, what then should you do, and how then should you live your life? And let's talk about that. And if we do it that way around then we will be a church that can reach out to those in a world that no longer recognizes the church at the center. If we can be that kind of church, then we won't assimilate or segregate. We won't be enslaved to the culture that is around us. But instead, we will be part of God's kingdom. And we will see heaven come to earth. And the kingdom of heaven will be at hand. And is that not the gospel? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is so hard to know how to interact with a culture that is so different from how it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago that seems to be ever shifting, where all the things we thought we knew have changed. But you never change. Your love for us never changes. Your desire to transform people's lives never changes. You are unchanging in a world that changes so rapidly. And you call your church You call your church to be in the world, but not of it. You call your church to reach out to those who have not heard the message of the gospel, and that is so many. But I pray that this would be a place where your kingdom rules. I pray this would be a place where people would encounter you and be transformed. I pray that this be a place where people walk through the door and can feel that the kingdom of God is at hand. But I pray for us that we would be people not who wait inside the door for those people to come through the threshold, but would go out, be beacons of light, be different, be bold for the sake of your kingdom and for the glory of your name. Amen. Our closing song today is a version of here, the call of the kingdom. Um, the Getty version is nice, but it's not, it's not very quick more than anything else. Um, and this one is a little bit more upbeat for the end of a service. There is a key change in the middle somewhere. Um, hopefully we'll still be able to hit the high notes at the end, but this is here, the call of the kingdom. <laughs>